Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Darren Hansen. I'm the Vice President and General Manager for OpenStack Private Cloud at Rackspace. Um, I'm going to be joined on stage uh, before the end of this 40-minute uh, session by uh, Jim Tricorico, who is one of our customers, and Justin Shepard, who is our CTO for our OpenStack business and one of our distinguished architects at Rackspace. So um, what we typically like to do at these times is, as quickly as possible, turn it over to uh, a customer and a very uh, credible technical resource to talk about OpenStack, OpenStack as a service. And when we talk about OpenStack as a service, it is really the customer experience and access to technologists, uh, the best technical talent in the world for operating OpenStack um, that really brings home the reason why you would work with a company like Rackspace. But before I get to them, I want to spend a little uh, bit of time on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the movies. So, how many cinephiles do we have in the room? Anybody that are movie lovers? Okay, good. Does anybody know what movie this is? Marathon. Marathon Man, excellent. I was so worried that it was going to be all millennials in here and nobody was going to have any idea what the hell Marathon Man is. So, Marathon Man is this really interesting movie. The 70s were a very uh, kind of scary time, you know, post Vietnam, Nixon's in the White House. So, movies were a little bit sadistic. Uh, you had your deer hunter, you had your taxi driver, you had your Marathon Man. So, Marathon Man is about an everyman, uh, played by Dustin Hoffman, who gets pulled out of his apartment and into a room with a chair where he is subsequently uh, kind of tortured and, uh, and molested by a former Nazi fascist, played by the great uh, Sir Laurence Olivier. So, I'm going to play a quick clip and then we'll, we'll talk maybe a little bit about bringing this home relative to, uh, to OpenStack. Audio? All right, we're going to go back. Audio? We're going to really have to crank it. All right, turn it. This one goes to 11. Another reference, all right. Is it safe? Yes, it's safe. It's very safe. It's so safe you wouldn't believe it. Is it safe? No, it's not safe. Very dangerous. Be careful. So I don't want to uh, compare anyone's boss or superior to a former Nazi fascist. That's entirely for you to decide <laughs> if that comparison has anything to do with your specific situation. But in this case, you have this fascist dude who is leaning over Dustin Hoffman, and all he will ask is, is it safe? Now, this could be any number of questions. Uh, is it secure? Does it scale? Uh, you know, does it perform well? Will it meet our needs? Will it remain up? But it's a very, very uncomfortable position for our hero, Dustin Hoffman, to be in. And so many of the people that have to make the decision to deploy OpenStack have to get through this, uh, this sort of round of scary, scary questions from their superiors about deploying OpenStack. The good news is that OpenStack has come a long way home. Uh, so, Rackspace as a founder and uh, the, the first and creator of OpenStack, uh, we were among the 75 people that were at that first OpenStack conference right here in Austin uh, six years ago. Uh, and it's now this thriving community of 30,000, 38,000 plus individuals, almost 600 companies. They're talking now about, you know, the 50% of the Fortune 100 are deploying or have deployed OpenStack. Um, and so, there's a lot to... Uh, be really, really energized about from the standpoint of those of us that are thinking about deploying OpenStack. But all of that doesn't necessarily uh, answer the boss's question about, is it safe? Or, does it scale? Yes, yes, it, it scales incredibly well. It's going to meet all of our performance needs. You wouldn't believe it. Will it scale? Uh, we're not sure. This is the first time we've played with this technology. It's never really been tested at this scale. <coughs> so. Getting through those questions is where, uh, you know, hopefully Rackspace is in a very specific position to help. Now, the reason that uh, you still have them asking, quest asking questions about whether or not it's safe is there are also some things out there about the number of uh, initial OpenStack deployments on the part of enterprises or large mid-market companies that fail the first time out. Um, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty about uh, stability and scalability and complexity and the pace and a new release every six months. So there's plenty of fear factor out there 
uh, that is creating a lot of this kind of uh, angst, 70s level angst um, on the part of our customers. And these are the two biggest reasons why there is such angst. And when you look at the OpenStack survey that was just released, these are the, the themes that really resonate and come home. One is complexity. Uh, the fact that OpenStack in and of itself is not a product. It's a series of awesome features, uh, projects, uh, code bases, uh, a really, really, really powerful set of, of tools that can transform your business and really allow you to move at a speed that was not possible before. And so that's very, very exciting, but it's not in and of itself a product. So what you're looking for is someone who can uh, tell you which pieces are ready for prime time, uh, which ones can be deployed HA, which ones sort of meet their primary use case and are ready for broad consumption, which ones have been tested to actually scale in production, which ones are running in production and for whom. These are the kind of questions that a OpenStack as a service partner can answer for you. And the other thing that you need is the talent that can help you put those pieces into a Millennium Falcon that can do the Kessel Run in 14 parsecs. 12, thank you, I was just a test. <laughs> also a Force Awakens reference, but okay. Uh, so you also need that team of talent that has configured it, deployed it, tested it, and done so at scales that probably, hopefully exceed what you're going to do for your own business, but maybe not. And we're happy to talk to you about uh, our capabilities in this space. So it occurred to me that when I'm hearing all this 70s level angst, and I'm hearing all of this fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because I hear it a lot when I talk to customers about, you know, is it safe? Does it scale? Will it meet my performance requirements? Uh, is it ready for production workloads? Is it, can you really deliver this with an SLA? And it occurred to me that a lot of these questions are coming from the perspective of the do-it-yourself model. So that leads me to the, the, this idea that there are two deployment options that you have with OpenStack. There's do-it-yourself, which in the extreme is literally you alone in a room. Um, you know, hopefully you have a team around you that is, uh, that is going to uh, rally around you, help you learn, help you deploy. But there's really do-it-yourself by taking the upstream OpenStack bits uh, and figuring out your own reference architecture and your own deployment. And then there's do-it-yourself with professionals um, who will come in and help you build something. So you, you have companies that will come in and uh, give you a distribution, which is an effort to sort of bring the old school um, software in a box uh, perspective on trying to productize OpenStack and the software subscription model. Um, but that still has a level of do-it-yourself in the sense that those companies will come in and provide professional services and build and design to help you get off the ground with your OpenStack private cloud. But you're still doing it yourself relative to what does it look like to operate it on an ongoing basis? What is it like to patch this environment? What is it like to upgrade this environment? What is it like to optimize this environment? What does my capacity planning tool set look like? How am I monitoring uh, where I am on compute and storage? Uh, and that I have the resources available to my neutron network uh, as my network traffic uh, continues to grow and grow. So really the message from, from Rackspace is that we feel like we have figured out the superior model for consuming OpenStack. Uh, and it's not DIY, it is OpenStack as a service. And when you consume OpenStack as a service, you get a few things. One, the superior model itself, which gives you a reference architecture, a reference deployment, um, a very specific way of deploying the OpenStack services, the control plane, the compute, the storage in a way that we've tested, that we have rolled out for more than 100 customers, that we know scales, that we can talk to you about how far we've been able to push these technologies and scale these technologies for our customers. They can all be delivered in high availability fashion. And because we have the experience, we've productized it, we've picked the right projects, we've deployed it in a very prescribed way, we can deliver a 99.99 industry leading uptime SLA, which was the first and still the best uptime SLA for making sure that the APIs are available to your applications uh, when you need them. Uh, third reason that it's a superior model, OpenStack as a service, is again, proven operational expertise. We talked about complexity and access to talent. First couple nail complexity. This middle one is about access to the team that has deployed and operated OpenStack uh, at a scale in the industry that is really uh, a factor of many 
Uh, when you consider our public cloud and the, the operation and ongoing deployment and optimization of our public cloud, which is running OpenStack, as well as running uh, OpenStack from everywhere from Fortune 5, Fortune 100, upper mid-market, for companies large and small, and a very diverse set of use cases. We have the unmatched portfolio where we can start with training and professional services, but then we move you through into what is really different about us, which is the 7x24x365 by by support and the public and private deployments that you can take advantage of. And then two weeks ago, we took OpenStack everywhere to another level, where in the past we've always been able to manage your OpenStack private cloud uh, anywhere in the world by providing some monitoring and some remote management hooks back to Rackspace to be able to manage your cloud for you. But now we've also uh, are delivering this cabinet level solution uh, where if you know that you have a certain level of scale and you've gone through the proof of concept, you've gone through the testing, we can now deploy the entire fanatical experience including an OPEX model, the capital ownership of all of the gear, um, and the networking equipment that makes your data center look exactly like a Rackspace data center. So if you have data sovereignty issues, if you have security issues, if you have compliance issues, and you're looking for a managed service provider that can provide really a hosted OpenStack solution, but in your data center asset that you've already made investments in or in a country where you have data sovereignty issues, now we can really provide that um, anywhere in the world. So a few customers. Uh, this is OSG, who is uh, our consulting partner that works with us on Barclay Card US. And I'm not going to read the quotes to you, but in, in three key areas that will help you overcome the objections or the 70s era uh, fear factor that exists around OpenStack, critical performance, improved speed of innovation, and OpenStack expertise. Again, this is an example of a customer where we are executing this, this mission and vision on a daily basis. Uh, Encompass is a digital media company that encodes uh, digital video and makes it available uh, for its consumers in a very uh, fast and agile way. Same thing, uh, how we perform for them from a critical performance standpoint, an improved speed to market standpoint, and an OpenStack expertise standpoint. And what we get told over and over again by companies that are evaluating different ways of deploying OpenStack, distributions, um, service providers, managed service, this is uh, one of our major retail uh, customers for whom um, their entire Black Friday shopping experience and, and all of their e-commerce for all of their brands, uh, multiple brands, runs in production on Rackspace Private Cloud powered by OpenStack, saying that we're two to three years ahead of every other OpenStack provider and distribution. But especially when it comes again, this is about operating and being with you throughout your entire journey um, as a customer as you consume OpenStack so that you can have the last laugh. And uh, again, this is entirely up to you if you actually do this to your boss, uh, who may or may not have fascist level qualities. But this is what we want you to be able to do is win at the end of the day and have a successful OpenStack deployment. And that is the end of my commercial part of the presentation. And let me take a quick pause to get a, a quick round of applause for Jim Tricorico from Open Exchange. Come on up, Jim. <clears throat> Yeah, either way. Cool. Which is your good side? Uh, both. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. Just kidding. Oof, you're better than me. I don't have one. Yeah. Uh, so tell us, Jim, a little bit about Open Exchange and your business, the business that you're in, uh, introduction to your company. Sure. Um, Open Exchange is, uh, well, we do a lot, but uh, we've been around for a while and we're focused on enterprise collaboration tools. So we do large scale email deployments. Uh, we do uh, word processing, uh, cloud-based word processing, spreadsheeting. Uh, we have secure uh, disk storage, things like that for our customers to use. So uh, we run the gamut. Um, we've been around for a while, and uh, we were primarily in the, in, in the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently, a couple years ago, we decided to um, make that giant leap into the US. Awesome. So when we did that, uh, we had a whole new set of challenges because our US customers were much larger than anything we'd ever done in the EU. Uh, so that's sort of how we started getting into OpenStack and, uh, and Rackspace. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about um, your evaluation of OpenStack and why your company eventually came around to choosing and deploying OpenStack and some of those experiences so far. Sure. So uh, Open Exchange is, is the, the word open and open exchange actually uh, matters here because from the top to the bottom of our company, we are extremely open, extremely transparent with our customer base. Uh, and really internally with our employees, we're, we're software agnostic. All of our employees use whatever they want to use as long as it gets the job done. Um, but we're also very customer focused. So if a customer says that they have these 
35,000 requirements, then we fit those. Um, we have, we're very focused on retention and things like that. So, uh, so a couple years ago, when we were mostly a software company, uh, we tried to do OpenStack internally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you all probably know how that worked out. Um, <laughs> it, it didn't work out so hot. Uh, but we did learn a little bit about it. And we learned enough to know that it was a very solid platform. Uh, and we just needed some help with it. Uh, so we, as we became more of a software as a service company, uh, we started looking for more of an infrastructure as a service partner. Uh, and, and that's sort of where we went to Rackspace because we needed those experts. We needed the guys that, that knew what they were talking about uh, from, from everything from compute to storage to uh, you, you name it, networking. Um, and while we could do that internally, uh, our focus was not on that. We, didn't, we, don't, we don't care to do that. That's not our business. Um, our business is to adapt our product and our software to our customers. So that's why we enter Rackspace, enter OpenStack. Uh, OpenStack gave us the, the flexibility to scale, uh, expand, contract, however we wanted to. Uh, the, the networking components were, were super cool. Uh, and now we've got this really world-class cl world data center, world-class partner, um, and we're, we're, we're really growing fast because of it. So tell us about the first couple of interactions. I mean, there's clear, uh, clearly a reason you went for a managed service mm -hmm. or OpenStack as a service. Sure. Tell us about the, uh, the couple of interactions with the type of credible technical talent that has been so powerful so far. Yeah, so we, I'm sure you all can imagine there are, there are a lot of challenges that come with uh, large enterprise scale, you know, big, big customers in terms of email uh, and, and things like that. So as we ran into those challenges, uh, internally we were like, well, who's gonna handle this? Who's gonna handle that? And it, it was just super nice to be able to go to Rackspace and say, look, we're facing this problem internally. You know, do you have any advice for us? And they're like, whoa, we don't need to give you advice. We can just do it for you. We can, <laughs> we can, we can show up and, you know, we've been to the castle in, in San Antonio, which was really cool. Uh, we met with a lot of good people. They've come to us. Uh, it's really just been a very, a lot of synergy, for lack of a better word, um, between Rackspace and us, and, and really with OpenStack as well, we've, we've really been able to leverage it the way we wanted to because awesome. of Rackspace. So. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Another round of applause, please, for Jim Chikorico. So uh, I want to pivot now quickly. We're going to talk specifically now about Neutron and um, scaling Neutron and what it means, again, to be able to partner with a company who has seen just about every challenge in the book. Um, and I'm going to invite on stage Justin Shepard, who is a distinguished architect, one of four distinguished architects at Rackspace, and uh, really one of the uh, credible voices that um, you know customers really, really value access to to be able to have conversations like this one. So, Shep, uh, talk to everybody about Neutron Absolutely. and what we're doing uh, to scale this particular technology. Thanks, Darren. Good afternoon. All right, real quick before we get started, how many people run? Neutron-based OpenStack clouds in the room. Quick hand. That's a good amount. All right, good. So, okay. those of you who haven't, you're going to find out some of the fun things. So, Neutron, uh, software project, contains 60 drivers across four different projects and sub-projects. You've got your base network drivers, you've got firewall drivers, load balancers, and VPN drivers. If I do the math on that, I think that comes up to about 30,000 plus combinations. So, I have to make all of those choices before I even start running anything. <laughs> Lots of fun. Um, now, if I throw in scale, I now have to manage and operate those and tune those at scale. This becomes all sorts of fun. I want to go back into the Marathon Man image of you sitting in a room. Try typing that into Google and getting help on your permutation of the combination at scale at 100,000 nodes. Um, so, Neutron is probably one of the most complex services. Uh, one of the things that we do see with customers is um, they run into a lot of pain when they're scaling. And so, um, I want to talk a bit about the pain, how to avoid it. All right, so the first piece, networking as a service. So you're gonna run Neutron, um, you're gonna put all SDN in here and you're gonna get some SDN goodness. Uh, traditionally, enterprises have developed application topologies over years and years and years of running these things, right? So the topology comes together based off of all sorts of stuff. It, your application design patterns influence it. Your security posture influences it. A lot of your operational practices influence it. A lot of your personal process stuff influences as well. Everyone's probably fairly familiar with a normal three-tier application, right? So I've got VLAN separation between all my three tiers. I've got firewalls in place of all three of these tiers, controlling access between each one of the tiers. I've got load balancers distributing traffic. Um, 
with these, whenever you add in new webs or a new app, let's say, everyone's kind of familiar with having to go into your ITIL ticketing system and say that you added a new box and submit a ticket to get a change request so that you can open up a port from web four off to this new database server or one of the new app servers. And it goes into some queue somewhere where someone has to go and manually click a button and look at an approval and say, yes, I agree that this change should happen. And ultimately, a lot of times, it boils down to some person has to log into one of these devices and actually start making a change. Um, whenever I start talking about software-defined networking, it transforms into this. So I just have a networking fabric where all of my VMs that are running all of the roles are just tapped into. And I still have all the functions. So I've got load balancers, I've got firewalls, I've got VPN, I've got routers. But the tools change. Each one of these now are virtual network functions, right? So these are st usually stripped down versions of their components. Um, if you're familiar with a Cisco router, as an example, if you start playing around with a Neutron router, those two are going to be wildly different worlds. Um, you don't have an IOS <coughs> console, you're not able to do um, VNIs set down onto the in infrastructure the same way that you're used to. So interacting with these is really a big thing. Um, so having said that, the, the next part of it, I would say, is everything's really a trade-off here. So you have all of these topologies that have built out over years. You have these security requirements. And trying to do this inside of a software-defined networking function um, can be tasking. On the left-hand side, or yeah, on the right-hand side, you have these big purpose-built devices, right? So you've got huge Cisco Nexus routers, or you've got checkpoint firewalls. You've got these things that have been designed over years and years and years and tuned to run and perform at optimized speeds. On the other side of the equation, now you have software. So I've got cheap software versus expensive hardware. Um, the point to note here is that the software is still maturing. So it may not actually do all the things that you want it to do. A great example of this trade-off is something like a VPN concentrator. Um, so a lot of enterprises have got VPN concentrators in their environments. So it's a purpose-built device that's able of handling and terminating thousands of VPN sessions from concurrent users, tunneling into your environment. The hardware is optimized. It's got uh, silica that has got hardware acceleration for all the, off the offloading of the encryption. You're able to centrally manage it. You generally, there's a single sign-on assigned with this. You're able to log in once and get into different parts of your environment. We all know that single sign-on is a bit of a lie in most places. Um, on the left-hand side, if I were to do the software, I've got VPN as a service. So today, the reference implementations for VPN as a service, I can't say that, VPN as a service, are things like OpenSwan, OpenVPN. Um, the important thing is this is just software that's running in the cloud that is terminated at the tenant level. It is on demand for the tenant to be able to spin these up, configure them however they want, peer with whatever they want. And so now you have lots of interesting challenges. How are you going to do your single sign-on management here? How do you start to manage all of the logging credentials? How do you enforce a lot of your security postures that you have? I mean, everyone's got auditors that come in and regularly check their environments if they're FISMA or HIPAA or PCI compliant. And those auditors kind of know with a hardware piece what questions to ask. Right? If you're running a checkpoint or a Cisco VPN concentrator or firewall, they know, OK, Here's the standard operating procedure that you're using for managing this. I can get to the log for auditing data. I know how to check and see if you're actually doing all the things that you say you do, how you're managing all your change control. Whenever I start introducing the software stack, all that kind of goes out of the window. The auditor is not familiar with any of those tools. And now you're talking about things like, well, I've got OpenVPN configured 100 different times inside of my cloud connecting to Lord knows what peers. Um, it's not centrally managed. It's completely on demand. All of the onus is now on the tenants. And that makes auditors cry. <laughs> um, the second thing that we tend to see is uh, a lot of enterprises will <laughs> use new tools in an old school way. Um, all right, so going back to the three tier application. So I've got some SDN now. I want to apply it everywhere. And there's this interesting thing called floating IPs. Floating IPs are really meant to allow you to have a well known IP for any kind of a role. And then it provides you the ability to detach and reattach to any instances across the system so that you're not having to deal with the ephemeralness of the IPs and the infrastructure, right? So it's an abstraction that separates those. Today, we see this all the time where customers will come in and they will go, OK, I'm going to put floating IPs everywhere. Obviously, this is better. It's SDN, all the things. It must be better. <laughs> well, turns out you just added a whole bunch of latency into the system and a whole bunch of choke points that can cause problems. You have troubleshoot for zero value. You haven't done anything here. 
Today, administrators are still logging into every single one of those boxes. They're pushing new code to that box. They're upgrading it. They're running a whole bunch of hand scripts. They're patching the operating system. You're not moving it anywhere. So I have a detachable resource that's connected to this that does me no good. I'm not attaching it, detaching it. It's there forever. So I've introduced a bunch of latency for zero reason. Where what you might want to do is take that same stack, put a floating IP in front of your web server, or maybe a load balancer would be a better representation here. And then whenever I get ready to deploy new code, I deploy a new web and app, assuming that all your state is kept in the database to hand wave over that piece a little bit. And then you can reattach the floating IP over to the right-hand side. Right, so now I'm actually using one of these features that is useful to me. I have reattached it. It gave me something. Um, I'm OK with any kind of performance hit that I'm taking because I gain something back. The last thing is that staying current matters. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I talk to enterprises where they really are asking for agility, speed, transformational service, but they also immediately go into the enterprise software lifecycle where they expect to live on the same code for three to five years, right? There are companies out there whose entire value proposition is pay me so I can protect you from all this innovation and I will, you know, long life software for you. I'll do all this backport. Um, by doing that, you miss out on a lot of the innovation. You miss out on all the bug fixes. You miss out on all the vulnerabilities or you're having to pay a hefty tax just to receive that, but you still probably don't get a bunch of the new features. And if we're going with all the software, we want to be on the newer versions because that's where all of the innovation is happening. That's where the new features happen. Most of the time, everyone that has a long life policy will not backport any kind of features. Um, and so all the innovation is happening on the new version. So upgrading, I get to cut all those out. I can't tell you how many vulnerabilities come through in each release. We've seen about two to five, but for any given product inside of the OpenStack, Big Tent, each one of these can have two to five of its own vulnerabilities, and half the time you might not even know about it. You also might be getting bug fixes that you didn't hit yet. So the best thing about running on the newest code is that you have the newest code. The, best, the worst part about running on the newest code is that you have the newest code. <laughs> so it does not come without its own challenges. Staying current is not easy either. Um, there was an example that we ran into where we had a Kilo environment stood up. We had hundreds of VMs, or thousands of VMs across to hundreds of hosts, all up and running. We upgraded it to Liberty. And because we were checking it at scale and we were monitoring it, this was a test environment, we were um, watching the ping times on all these VMs. Whenever we did this upgrade, all of a sudden the ping times jumped by a, an order of magnitude. So I went from a couple milliseconds to maybe a second, or sub, just, just short of a second. Um, turns out, that it actually had to do with a feature that was released that does um, IP tables state management. And so your security groups, it does a diff between where you're coming from and where you're going to and attempts to just load just the smallest portion of security groups that get you in compliance. Um, there was a bug at scale whenever you're running this, a race condition, where it actually wiped out your entire IP table set for your security groups and then re laid them down. Um, but it also commingled with some of the existing rules, so it got into a really squirrely state. Now, this was because it was running at scale. If you were running this on DevStack, it worked in DevStack, you wouldn't have ever seen this. Matter of fact, it gated without any problem. But because we were running this at large scale, we were able to see it. So that's one of the last things here is being able to check all of these things at scale, being able to see them running in large scale and find those race conditions and those bugs where it's not necessarily a small scale implementation or specifically you wouldn't find it in a single instance of the code. But whenever you run it at scale, they do pop up. Um, this is part of the reason why we actually founded the OpenStack Innovation Center with Intel, is to be able to start finding these problems and be able to run these things at scale, be able to test networking environments at scale, be able to gate at scale, and be able to find all these issues that only crop up under scale. Um, as part of the OpenStack initiative, uh, we have 2,000 node clusters that are available for the community to develop on. Um, not to turn it into a pitch, but it is important. It is there. It is a resource that the community is capable of using. You find people. Um, you now don't have to necessarily check it on your laptop. You can actually check it at scale. You can put in a reservation request and get access to a large number of machines to be able to run these patches through. 
Um, there's some work that we're actually doing with the OpenStack Foundation and the OpenStack Infra teams as well to start putting this in. Um, so you should start seeing some of this benefit, but I would invite you to join in with the initiative and start bringing test cases to the OpenStack Innovation Center so that we can start finding these things, because the best place to find these bugs is the people that are running them and running into it. Um, lastly, before I go into Q&A, uh, so Rackspace has got the Rackspace Cantina. Um, I am not the smartest Neutron guy in the world. This man may be. He literally wrote the book. Um, come on by the OpenStack Cantina. He's doing a book signing tomorrow. Um, I think, actually, he's doing another session as well. So the Rackspace Cantina. Please come by. Now, I will open up for questions and answers. Does anyone have a question? Yes, sir. Have you guys ever looked at anything besides Neutron? Um, in, in production use? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, for a long time, right, we ran Nova Networking. Um, before Neutron, we ran Nova Networking, but since Neutron is there, it is the thing that has all the integration points. And so running something that is not Neutron means that you're going to have to rewrite a whole bunch of compatible APIs and manage an entire system and furthermore really backport all those changes. Right now, you've wedged yourself in between two projects and you have to proxy either side. So Neutron starts implementing some new API calls to Neutron, you have to proxy that. Neutron starts implementing new APIs, you have to kind of do a bunch of work where working on the Neutron code base is probably a simpler problem. There was another hand. Yes, sir. It is. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Evan. Lord of the Rings reference. Marathon man, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so one of the things that we actually see with a lot of customers is, yeah, thank you, um, <laughs> is uh, we tend to actually advise them to take a mixed approach, right? So you actually can run overlay and non-overlay. Um, you can do provider networks or VLAN networks and actually propagate those up to the cloud. They're not cloudy, right? So you don't necessarily have programmatic access, but there's a lot of use case that can be met by that, and it still allows you to tie in a lot of your physical devices that you're used to managing. Go ahead. Um, so that is an ongoing challenge. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not a solved problem by any means. Um, we do, uh, we see that a lot where actually the developer community is the one that does most of the pure SDN. It's a good use case, it makes a lot of sense. Um, auditing for that is depending on your environment. Sometimes dev environments aren't as audited as strictly as production environments, sometimes they are. Uh, there are some tools out there that start to help this and there is a lot of work going on inside of some of the logging projects to be able to give the auditability tracks back to auditors. There is, without a doubt, some sort of um, education is going to happen with the auditor community where they have to get used to being able to get an output of IP tables or um, OVS flows or all these things that are the security mechanisms and be able to understand them and translate them back into the checkboxes that they're used to. Yeah, it's very much a hole in the space. It's emerging technology part of the space, and, and there are um, technology providers out there that are looking at providing um, virtual network functions for those things that will tap in line for that, and then you're able to actually manage it through policy management and set the policy at create time so that you don't have users that can get themselves into a violated state. Um, there are a couple of them out there right now. I think you're starting to see them, like Cloud Passage is one that I can just think of off the top of my head, not to pimp them, um, that is starting to do this. And they're starting to put in those functions that have tiebacks to the auditing systems that you're used to of record and being able to integrate towards those. And so I think you'll actually see those guys come up a lot in the next couple of years, right? Because, I mean, software-defined networking has been around for a little while, but in the grand scheme of things, not very long. Um, it is now 
it's been in cloud mostly and you're starting to see it go back into the data center. It depends on where you've seen it. Sometimes you may have seen it at the data center first. Uh, but a lot of those tools have yet to catch up. And so now as you get into environments that are security conscious, you're going to have to ask and beat on your vendors of you need to give me these tools that I can manage policy management. I can't have some person logging in and clicking a button. Um, I have to be able to access it programmatically. And you have to vote with your wallets on that. If a customer, if a vendor won't sell it to you, don't buy it from them. Go buy it somewhere else. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm going to be a jerk. The dude two seats behind you that just made a comment a minute ago is the guy you want to talk to about hairpinning. He's the dude that wrote that code. You're welcome, Evan. <laughs> yeah, right there, the little white shirt right there holding his hand up. Um, so the VXLAN, um, so on the private cloud OpenStack side, we actually use straight up VXLAN. Um, we implement Linux Bridge instead of OVS. Today, um, that has more to do with history. Uh, OVS on the 1. series was a little rough operationally. Um, there have been giant strides in it, and we probably need to reevaluate that. But today we actually do it with Linux Bridge because it's the same set of tools everyone understands from a Linux engineer perspective, um, and it's not re-implementations of all of them. So we do that, and then it's straight up VXLAN. No uh, not on our core product today. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, if you think, look at things like Open Daylight, right? They're actually starting to recognize Linux Bridge as a viable option. You go to their front page, the install instructions aren't for OVS, they're for Linux Bridge. Any other questions? Time check? You want four minutes back? Thank you.